Dr. Seuss Bruaha proves one thing. Cancel culture must be canceled. We must not tolerate people telling us what we can read, what we can see, and how we educate our children. Cancel the cancel culture. Today on The Dirt Show. The continued brouhaha over Dr. Seuss and his books provides, uh, I think, a useful opportunity to think about how cancel culture can be used both in a somewhat positive and in a totally negative way. Uh, there are two approaches to cancel culture, basically. Number one, you cancel the entire person. So you say that we're never again going to allow this person to speak. We're never going to listen to his or her music or view his art. He is out of the culture. He is now canceled, period. That's one approach. The other approach is the guy is not so bad or the woman, uh, but they did something bad. They wrote one book or had a cartoon or made a statement. And um, we'd like to cancel that. But we're not going to cancel the person. Uh, the reason I say the Dr. Seuss brouhaha raises that issue is because if you look at how it originally started, one can justify it. That is, Dr. Seuss's own um, company, the company that owns his legacy and decides what to publish, how to publish it, made a decision. They, they brought in a group of experts. And they decided that out of his 70 or so books, six of them would no longer be published. They would now be uh, out of print, and you could get them in used bookshops. Nobody could stop that. You can get it in the library, and the New York Public Library actually said it would continue to carry Dr. Seuss's books. But the publishing company, the estate, said, we've made a decision that we don't want to publish these six books anymore. We don't think it makes our client, Dr. Seuss, look good. Basically, what they're saying is if Dr. Seuss was still alive today, he died, I think, in the early 1990s. If he were alive today, he would probably say, gee, you know, I've now rethought uh, how I portrayed uh, uh, African people, how maybe how I portrayed uh, Chinese Americans, uh, maybe that isn't what I want children to be exposed to now in my name, so I'm withdrawing those books. That would be a perfectly rational, perfectly rational decision. But to zealots, that's not enough. They want to cancel Dr. Seuss. They want to say, he is a bad man. Uh, he should no longer be honored. Uh, you'll recall that just the other day was Read in America Day, and every year it was uh, Ted Ted Geisel's birthday, uh, the man who is Dr. Seuss, um, and every year the president would uh, make an announcement on this day of reading and honor, honor uh, Ted Geisel, uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, when President Biden made the announcement, he didn't mention Dr. Seuss. Did he cancel him? Did his advisors say, look, it's, it's too much in controversy today. It, it will distract from the major message. Let's wait, not this year, maybe next year. We'll, we'll wait and see. But the distinction I'm drawing is between total cancellation of the person and, and cancellation of individual books or articles that are deemed offensive. Look, I, I'm not in favor of, of either myself, personally. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, to my mind, the greatest writer uh, of modern times. Um, two of my favorite books, which I go back to and read all the time, are The Brothers Karamazov and, and Crime and Punishment. Um, and uh, yet he wrote an essay on the Jewish question, which could have been written by Adolf Hitler or Goebbels or any of those Nazis. It could have been in Uh In his essay on the Jews, he ignorantly uh, accuses Jews of dual loyalty, of being deceitful, of of, of hoarding gold so that they can carry it to the promised land. Every stereotype right out of the protocols of the elders of Zion. So when I taught a course on morality to freshmen at Harvard, how did I deal with that issue? I assigned the essay. I had the students read the essay, the anti-Semitic essay. I wanted them to ask themselves the question, how could so brilliant a man, and, and, and Dostoevsky's mind, 
was so brilliant. I mean, you could teach a whole course on philosophy or law out of the Brothers Karamazov or Crime and Punishment. How could so brilliant a mind be so ignorant? When it came to anti-Semitism, how could he be so blinded by the bigotry of his day that he would write these things? And, and it turns out Dostoevsky had Jewish agents and Jewish literary friends. And he said, in being asked about that essay, he wasn't writing about Jews he knew. He was writing about the Jews. Uh, and, and I thought it was important for my students to read that, just as I thought it was important for my students to read Justifications for slavery, not nobody in my classes was going to be persuaded that slavery was acceptable, but it was important to put them in the mindset of 1840 South Carolina and understand how a person who they would regard as otherwise decent could support the owning of people, the enslavement of people. It is so incomprehensible. But what an educational moment. What an opportunity to probe deeply into these issues of the human mind. So I always welcomed the opportunity to give students horrible, horrible things to read. Of course, my students were 18 years old, and the people reading uh, Dr. Seuss were not. They were six and seven and eight. And certainly, it's possible that the first images that a young six-year-old white American might have of a black African would come from a stereotype portrayal in a Dr. Seuss book, and Dr. Seuss would probably himself say, "Gee, I, I wish I hadn't. I wish I hadn't done that." I'll give you another example. During the Second World War, he was a cartoonist, uh, and he, like so many Americans, portrayed Japanese people in the most negative way. They had just bombed Pearl Harbor. They had killed Americans. Uh, Americans were dying in the Pacific. When I was a kid, we used to sing a song: "Whistle while you work." Hitler is a jerk. Mussolini is a meanie, and the Japs are worse. I use the word Japs. I would never use that word today. Yeah, now today Japs has a different meaning. Jewish American princess, just as negative in some ways. But hey, it's my people, so I can joke about them. I don't, by the way, use that term because I'm not a woman. If I were a Jewish American woman, maybe I'd feel a little more comfortable teasing people about that phenomenon, but I don't feel comfortable doing it. But that's a, a personal choice. And I would never, ever use that word that Dr. Seuss used to portray Japanese people in the negative light. But I was a child during the Second World War, not an adult. I do remember going to the movies and watching. I remember particularly one Batman movie um, where the um, Japanese people were portrayed in the most negative possible way. But that's what happens during wartime. The Krauts, the Germans, <coughs> were portrayed in such a negative way as well during the Second World War. Interestingly enough, the Germans were never portrayed as negatively as the Japanese. There was an element of racism. We detained 110,000 Japanese Americans in detention centers. We did not detain 110,000 German Americans in, uh, in concentration camps or detention centers. So the, even when we treat our enemies, we treated them with a bit of racism. There are them who believe. I don't believe this, but there are some who believe that we dropped the atomic bomb on Japan rather than on Germany uh, because we didn't want to kill so many white Germans. History doesn't bear that out. We didn't have the atomic bomb by the time Germany uh, surrendered in the spring of 1945. It was developed only later when Japan was still fighting in the Pacific. But those arguments were out there, and there's no question that racism lies deep in the psyche of many Americans and that slavery is one of the great, great evils inflicted on the world, inflicted not by America alone. Obviously, if you go back to the Declaration of Independence, the first draft, Jefferson blamed the British for allowing slaves to be brought into the United States. They took that out of the Declaration because they looked at Jefferson and said, my God, does hypocrisy know, oh, know no limits? You just wrote the Declaration of Independence on a desk built for you by a slave, and now you're complaining about slavery. You own 200 slaves at that time, something like that, and you're putting in the Declaration of Independence a complaint about Britain for slavery. It's complicated, obviously, and there's enough blame to go around. But getting back to, to Dr. Seuss, the reason it's very important not to cancel Dr. Seuss, Dr. Seuss was a great man. 
when I knew him, when I met him as 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 Ted Geisel, as I mentioned, he and I had the same publisher, and we had a mutual friend, Bob Bernstein, one of the great civil rights, civil liberties, human rights uh, people of our generation. He was Ted Geisel's close friend in the 1980s. Why? Because by the 1980s, Ted Geisel was a leading force against racism in America. He was a leading force against anti-Semitism. Yes, early in his career, he had used, like so many other people had used, anti-Jewish stereotypes. But by the time I knew him, he had been honored by the mayor of Jerusalem, Teddy Kolek, for his work on on supporting uh, Jews, Jewish values, the Jewish nation, all of that. People change uh, in the end. Ted Geisel was a great man, a great contributor to America, a wonderful person. He should never, ever be canceled. Yes, he partook of of stereotypes, some worse than others. Um, But uh, one can easily make a personal judgment about how to deal with those books. If I were now bringing up young children or young grandchildren, I wouldn't have control over my grandchildren, obviously, but my children, I would read them from uh, Dr. Seuss's uh, books, even the bad ones, even the negative ones. And I would say to them, even at six or seven years old, now you see how he portrays African people. You're in school, you're in kindergarten, first grade, you know people whose family came from Africa, and you see they're not like that at all. They're just like you. And he shouldn't have done that. And here he is, you love his book about you know green eggs and ham, and you love his other books, but here even he partook in some of those stereotypes. Yeah, I would tell that to a six-year-old or a seven or an eight-year-old. That would be my choice as a parent. That wouldn't be the school's choice. That wouldn't be the government's choice. I decide how to bring up my children. I'm very proud of how I brought up my children. And uh, I don't want the government telling me how to do it. And I don't want cancel culture telling me how to do it. And so... You go to Amazon today and you see that there was a revolt, a rebellion against the cancellation of Dr. Seuss. What happened? His books are now number one Amazon bestsellers. It it, it reminds me of a situation years ago when a a client, I won't name him, asked me to try to get his movie banned in Boston. You know, banned in Boston was a famous phrase. He wanted to get his movie banned in Boston because the movie wasn't doing very well. And he figured if it got banned in Boston, everybody would want to see it. People just love forbidden fruit. Uh, I I did not succeed in getting it banned in Boston, and the movie didn't didn't succeed. Uh, But uh, uh, that's what happened on Amazon just the other day. Uh, Look, Amazon is having real problems. Uh, It has a a logo, uh, a logo, the typical logo of Amazon, and somebody who is very sensitive or oversensitive said, oh, my God, look at that logo. It looks like Hitler's mustache. No, it doesn't. It looks like Amazon's logo. It doesn't look like Hitler's mustache. You got to be really perverse to see Hitler in that image. But what do you think? Amazon did. It took it down. It said if there are a couple of people who think it looks like Hitler's mustache, then we're not going to second guess their perception and we're going to take it down. Uh, Of course, Amazon has not canceled Adolf Hitler. Uh, Go on Amazon. I'm not urging you to do it. And just put mine confident, I did it yesterday. And picture after picture of Hitler with his Hitler salute, with uh, the mustache, with Mein Kampf. You can buy an original copy of Mein Kampf. Cost a fortune. Uh, Collectors buy it. Uh, You can buy a copy for $12, for $4. You can get soft cover, hard cover. You can get any number of copies of Mein Kampf. It hasn't been canceled. Dr. Seuss, his six books have been canceled. Hitler's books have not. The Hitler estate, obviously, is still proud of Hitler's books, and and they're out there to be sold. And there are collectors. There are people who collect Nazi memorabilia and Nazi books and and other kinds of uh, accoutrements of Nazism, some because they support Nazism, some just because they're collectors. I'm a collector. I don't collect Nazi uh, material, but I am a collector. And yes, I collect material from Thomas Jefferson. And if I could find a letter of Thomas Jefferson justifying slavery, I'd I'd buy it. Uh, It would be very important uh, to own a letter like that, to have a letter like that. Um, 
collectors buy a great many things. And so there's a big difference between canceling the person, canceling the book, canceling the book for six year olds, canceling the book for 18 year olds. These are all subtle decisions, but we don't live in a time of subtlety. We live in a time of black and white. Dr. Seuss, bad, cancel. Dr. Seuss, good, number one on the bestseller list. Nobody wants to think about things in a nuanced way. The answer is Dr. Seuss was a great man who did some not so great things when judged by contemporary standards of the world. Dr. Seuss would have been the first to recognize that. He would have acknowledged that he shouldn't have portrayed black people in the way he did, probably Asian people in the way he did. That's a closer question if you look at the actual picture. It's a close question. I think if he had to do over again, he wouldn't do it uh, that way. How he portrayed people of different backgrounds. I mean, if Dickens were alive today, would he have created Fagin, uh, the Jew, in the way he did? Uh, perhaps he would have. I don't know. Uh, would Renoir have said the things he said about women, that they belong only in the bedroom in the kitchen, and portrayed women in the way he portrayed them? Uh, should that result in the cancellation of all of Renoir's paintings? Should it result in rethinking some of Renoir's portrayals of women? And, and Picasso, the way he treated women, was an abomination. Uh, there are so many other people like that in our literature. I guess Mark Twain is the perfect example. Mark Twain's writing is probably the greatest American uh, uh, writer. And yet, yes, he uses the N-word. And he has mostly very positive portrayals of um, uh, African Americans, but some negatives. He was trying to reflect the reality of his time. We certainly don't want to ban Mark Twain. Theodore Dreiser, who wrote The American Tragedy, uh, was in his personal life an anti-Semite, as was T.S. Eliot and uh, Ezra Pound and many other... Gertrude Stein! The great hero, Gertrude Stein. People read Gertrude Stein in college all the time. Um, you know, a rose is a rose. Uh, Gertrude Stein was a rampant pro-Hitler, pro-Nazi zealot. She nominated Hitler for the Nobel Peace Prize. She wrote the introduction to uh, the book written by the Nazi occupier, uh, the he head of the occupation in the south of France. She collaborated with the Gestapo. She may very well have revealed the hiding place of Jewish children. She is a horrible, horrible, horrible human being. She's one that I would cancel totally. First of all, I don't think her writing is very good. I've never, ever thought her writing is very good, and I don't think her taste in art was very good. It was her brother who had the great taste in art. Most of the things that Gertrude Stein thought was great art turned out to be not such great art. It was her brother who discovered Picasso and Matisse and, uh, and others. But she today is an icon among many feminists. Gertrude Stein, go back and read her history. Read a book called Strange Collaboration, uh, written by a Dartmouth professor about her collaboration with Nazism and how she, a Jew, with her partner, uh, Alice Toklas, managed to live in the open and survive the Holocaust, living openly in, in France. Of course, she was a Nazi collaborator. Uh, how many people know that? So, you know, we're so selective in how we cancel a people. Dr. Seuss with Gertrude Stein? Oh, my God. Dr. Seuss, I'm sure if you believe in heaven and hell, Dr. Seuss is in heaven, uh, entertaining God with his wonderful lyrics. And Gertrude Stein has a special place for herself in hell for what she did. And so, you know, you have to look at the total person. You have to look at everything they did, everything they stood for, everything they wrote. And in the end, don't cancel. In the end, educate. In the end, use the statues of uh, Jefferson Davis. Use the statues of Robert E. Lee to teach students about the Civil War and about how the Confederacy was glorified for so many years in the South. Teach them about the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Teach them about lynching. There's a great lynching museum now uh, in, in the South. There should be. Education is the answer. The answer is never suppression. You answer falsehood with truth. You answer bad books with good books. 
You take bad books and bad writing, you put them in context, you explain them, you write about them, you teach about them. Everything produced on the earth can be a subject of education. Yes, you can use Mein Kampf to illustrate the evils of how dangerous free speech can be and it can be. You can use Der Sturmer in that way. You can use every stereotype, every anti-black, every anti-Asian, every anti-Muslim stereotype to teach, to educate, to help refine. That's what education is all about. So I am totally against cancel culture, period, at all. But if you're gonna cancel, if you're gonna have any cancel culture at all, at least make it focused on the objectionable material. Have standards, have criteria, make sure they're neutral and objective. And if you think a particular book should be taken off Amazon, all right, make that argument. I, I will disagree. I'll fight against it. I think people should have the right to buy the book if they want to buy it. But make the argument against the book. Make the argument against Dr. Seuss's six books, as his own estate did. Don't cancel Dr. Seuss. Don't cancel Mark Twain. Don't cancel Renoir. Don't cancel Picasso. That marks the end of our civilization if we forget the past. Those who forget the past are destined to repeat it. And our past is filled with racism and sexism and homophobia and anti-Semitism and anti-Islam and anti-Asia. Every bigotry in the book has been accepted in America by some Americans, including some very prominent Americans. Let's teach about it. Let's learn the lessons of the past. Cancellation is anti-intellectual. Cancellation is anti-historical. Cancellation is anti-freedom of speech. Cancellation should be canceled completely and totally. Let the people decide. We are smart enough. We are good enough to distinguish between good writing and bad writing, between racism and anti-racism. We are smart enough to make that decision. We don't need the government to make it for us. We don't need Amazon to make it for us. We can make those decisions for ourselves. Interested to hear your views on Dr. Seuss and on cancellation on The Dirt Show. Now for the wits on The Dirt Show, our first caller. Hi, Alan. Tony Schramm, San Antonio, Texas. Quick question. I agree with you on the international court situation, but why can't Israel just simply say, sorry, you have no jurisdiction over you, over us. We're going to ignore you, do what you want. You know, you're not going to touch you know, any of our soldiers or any of our citizens, and we're not cooperating. The end. Just was curious on what you thought. It's a great question, and there are some Israel who take that position. The problem is, if the International Criminal Court convicts a particular Israeli, say a soldier, uh, a friend of mine uh, who is the head of the Israeli Air Force, I'm actually his lawyer. I promised him he was ever prosecuted. I would be his pro bono lawyer. Uh, if he is convicted, and if he gets on an airplane and lands in Paris, he could be arrested. And the Israelis say, we don't recognize it, but he'd be in jail. And so Israel has to fight it. Um, they um, uh, can refuse to accept the ruling, but other countries will accept the ruling. And so unless they can get assurances from other countries like France and England and Italy and Germany that they won't enforce a decision of the International Criminal Court, they're going to have to fight it. I think what Israel is going to do is going to fight it on the merits, both legally and factually. Um, and it will present evidence. Whether or not the investigation will be a fair one remains to be seen. The last time the United Nations uh, investigated Gaza, they came up with the Goldstone Report, which even Goldstone eventually rejected, uh, and putting all the blame basically on, on Israel for defending itself in the Gaza Strip. So I don't think Israel can expect a fair investigation, but at least it'll have an opportunity to present this case. There are videotapes. There are hard contemporaneous evidence that Israel took tremendous efforts to protect civilian life. You know, it has a policy of when it targets a building, which has, for example, Hamas rockets being fired from the building, it first gives a warning to the people in the building, allowing them to leave 
because it just wants to destroy the base. Now, obviously, it also gives the terrorists an opportunity to leave. If Israel really didn't care about civilians, they would just bomb the building and they would kill the terrorists along with the civilians. But when they know there are civilians in the building, they give them an opportunity to leave. I was once at um, um, headquarters when they were trying to kill a terrorist. And I could see on the screen they were closing in on the terrorists and then civilians appeared and they canceled the event. They allowed the terrorists to escape because there was too much of a risk that civilians uh, might be injured or killed. Israel takes great, great efforts to prevent that from happening. And I think any fair investigation will prove that, whereas Hamas, on the other hand, targets school buses and, and schools and children and hospitals and tries to incur maximum damage to civilians. So any fair investigation would conclude that Israel was totally innocent and also had a legal system that could deal with it. But I don't think we can anticipate a fair investigation. But Israel doesn't simply have the option of ignoring the International Criminal Court because a hundred and some odd countries in the world recognize the court and will enforce their judgments. Yeah, Alan, my name is Joe Russo. I'm the guy that proposes that we should use the precedent against this can cancel culture, kicking people off of Facebook and, and uh, Twitter and books being canceled by Amazon. Uh, from the 60s, when we refused the blacks a uh, seat at the lunch counter and refused blacks and brown people apartments by private industry, if they couldn't do it then, how can they do it now? So I think somebody ought to file a lawsuit. The Supreme Court, I think, would be on their side. What do you think? And uh, I'm from Cedar City, Utah. Thanks, and have a great day. It's a great question. Of course, the reason that we were able to enforce integration in the South and compel segregation of schools and lunch counters is there was legislation. There were laws passed. I was in Washington I was a law clerk on the Supreme Court when these laws were passed. The Civil Rights Act, Lyndon Johnson, the greatest civil rights president, um, um, passed a lot of these laws. Without the laws, they couldn't have enforced it. The problem is that lunch counters don't have First Amendment rights, um, whereas Twitter and Facebook have First Amendment rights. They have the right as private publishers to decide what to put on their sites. They don't have a right to have a Section 230 exemption for what they put on their sites, but it's much more complicated under the Constitution when we're dealing with private companies that have First Amendment rights than when back in the 60s we were dealing with lunch counters and restaurants and uh, trains and hotels that segregated. Uh, moreover, we don't have laws today that control that, and the laws would have to pass constitutional muster. So it's a much, much more complicated issue, but it's a great question. Hi, Professor Dershowitz. This is Kevin Vizier from calling from Louisiana. H.R. 1 really concerns me, and I think uh, it, it terrifies me, actually. Uh, I think it's a way for the Democrats to stack the deck and ensure that Republicans have no chance of winning future elections. If this bill passes, is there any uh, path forward through the courts to overturn it and deem it unconstitutional? It's a great question. H.R. Uh, 1, of course, is a massive, massive bill. I've had a chance to peruse it. I've read a lot of it, but I can't tell you I've read every single word of it. Um, it has passed the House and is unlikely to pass the Senate in its current form. Obviously, it was written by Democrats, and it does have the effect of helping Democrats, but its goal, its purpose is uh, much, much more positive. Its goal is to increase the number of voters without increasing the amount of fraudulent voting or corrupt voting. That's a very, very difficult balance to strike. Uh, it federalizes a lot of issues that used to be left to the states. Now, we know for sure under the Constitution that the state legislatures have ultimate control over presidential elections. Congress does not have control over the voting in presidential elections um, because 12th Amendment, the Constitution itself, talks about state legislatures determining the qualifications for determining electors. As I've said before in the show, and it always surprises people, a state could decide not to allow anybody to vote for president. They could do that under the Constitution. 
and just say the state legislature will pick electors and the electors will decide who will be the president. No state would ever do that, but it's permissible under the Constitution. Congress has much more power to determine criteria for electing members of Congress. There is an amendment to the Constitution that says that the senators shall be elected and that the criteria for voting for senators shall be the same as the criteria for voting for state legislatures. So we have a constitutional amendment dealing with the Senate. We have a constitutional amendment dealing with the president. But there's much more flexibility in how you elect members of the House of Representatives. And the bill has a lot of provisions. Some are positive. Some are very good. Um, some are questionable. There are some restrictions on free speech. The ACLU has come out against at least some provisions of earlier versions of the bill. I don't know where they stand now on the bill as it was passed by the House. But I think much of it would be upheld by the courts. Some of it would probably be struck down by the courts. And uh, there is a severability clause in the statute that says if some of it is struck down, the rest of it will survive. So I think we're going to see a lot of litigation if the Senate passes a version of HRR1. But I wouldn't jump to conclusions saying it's all bad or it's all good. I think people have to study the bill and decide what aspects of it are positive, what aspects are negative. The goal should always be maximize the number of eligible voters who go to the polls and vote, minimize the number of fraudulent votes or mistaken votes. How to strike that balance is the goal of H.R. 1. Was it achieved? Can it be achieved? Will the Senate make it a better law? Stay tuned. This is Dan Van Dyke. I'm calling from Rochester, Minnesota. Professor Dershowitz, I just read through a lot of your book, Taking the Stand, My Life in the Law. I thought it was wonderful. As a biologist, it was all new information for me. Um, one of the things you opined about near the end of the book was the future of various um, parts of the government. And you proposed that the Supreme Court influence would wane over time. This was in 2013 or so. What do you think today about the Supreme Court's influence on the United States uh, law? Thank you. It's a great question. I've always thought that we overstate the effect of the Supreme Court on the life of Americans. Um, I think back in my 82 years of being on this earth, I can think of no more than about a dozen Supreme Court decisions that impacted my life, directly or indirectly. Um, you can imagine what they are. Brown versus Board of Education, desegregating the schools, uh, gay marriage, um, um, separation of church and state decisions. But for the most part, Supreme Court decisions don't have a daily impact on the lives of Americans. Legislation has enormous impact. The presidency has enormous impact. The Supreme Court, being the decider of last resort on many issues, potentially has a great impact, but not as much as, as one would imagine. Uh, and that's the way it should be. Uh, courts are unelected, and they're not accountable to the people. Uh, they are essentially an, a check on democracy, and they should be used sparingly. So I do think the Supreme Court's impact uh, will diminish over time, has diminished over time. And every year or two or three, it will come up with a dramatic decision that will change our lives. And that will be very, very important. But it's not the Supreme Court that decides whether we go to war. It's not the Supreme Court that decides how we allocate our resources. It's not the Supreme Court that decides tax policies. It's not the Supreme Court that decides how we deal with COVID. Uh, those are all done by other institutions in a democracy. So people shouldn't either understate or overstate the role of the Supreme Court in our country. Hi, Professor. This is uh, Moshe Rapp from Jerusalem. Uh, I am calling in, uh, to discuss uh, your request for our comments about uh, the right of having Lila Khaled speak at an American university. Right. 
Uh, I'm a victim of the hijacking carried out by Laila Khaled and her organization, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, on September 6, 1970. My mother and her five children were held hostage by her terrorist organization for a week in the Jordanian desert, while my brother was held for three weeks. I understand and accept your argument that we as Americans have a right to hear anyone in their opinion. I do object, however, to an institution funded by Uncle Sam to use those funds to invite and glorify terrorists and, and our enemies as heroes. As one of her victims, it deeply disturbed me that as a taxpayer, I would have to help pay for our youth and future leaders to listen to her poison, especially since the University of San Francisco did not present it as a balanced discussion. I'd like to hear your thoughts about that, and I love your show. I have learned so much from you, and I look forward to hearing it for many, many more years. Thank you. Well, thanks for your kind words. I generally agree with what you've said. Um, I don't think that the University of San Francisco should have sponsored Lila Khaled. She is a villain, an evil person. Uh, I personally would not benefit from hearing her. I would not want my children necessarily to hear her. And most importantly, I would not want my tax dollars to go to paying uh, for her. I don't know how many tax dollars were involved. I doubt that she was paid for her speech. She's anxious to spew her poison. Um, I... I pose a somewhat different issue, and that is, should the government prevent her from speaking? Let's put aside the public university. Let's assume a group of uh, just awful people, Americans, said we want to hear Lila Khaled. No, we would just like to hear her, and, and, and we'd like to have a Zoom call with her. Um, I don't think the United States government should stop her from speaking. She has no right to speak to Americans, but Americans have the right to listen to her garbage. And hopefully they will understand that it's garbage. Uh, mostly she would be preaching to the converted. But uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I would not want a university necessarily to sponsor her talk and certainly not to glorify it. If you wanted to make it part of a discussion about terrorism and have, for example, somebody like me on the other side explaining that having people like Lila Khaled speak at a university actually encourages terrorism. It rewards terrorism. It makes it more likely that you will be a victim of terrorism, as the caller's family was a victim of terrorism. So I generally agree with the thrust of what you said. I just wouldn't censor, have the government censor uh, a speaker who herself was not allowed to be in the United States, who was a terrorist, but who Americans foolishly wanted to listen to. I know that's a hard balance to strike, but I think that's the proper approach under our First Amendment. But great question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen, and I'm calling from New York City. Um, I have a question uh, that pertains to uh, the free speech issue that you, for obvious reasons, speak quite a bit about on your podcast. Um, it, it, today is the 4th of March, 2021, and it was announced by uh, Google and their subsidiary YouTube that they'd be removing all uh, recordings of the CPAC speech from uh, President Trump. And it's actually resulted in the suspension of uh, several high-profile accounts, uh, the most notable of which, I guess, is the Right Side Broadcasting Network, which um, does the live feeds from conservative events and whatnot, um, remove their account for not providing, uh, I guess, equitable views or, or something to that effect. Um, but basically removed all recording, the historical log of the, the speech having been given. Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Look, it's a, it's a good question. I don't agree with it at all. I think that nobody should have their speeches removed. I wanted to watch President Trump's speech. I didn't agree with much of it. I wished he had tried to bring us more together and wished he had uh, spoken in the spirit of Lincoln. Um, but he didn't. And I wanted to hear his speech. I'm entitled to hear it. And I don't want some ca satellite or cable carrier to tell me what I can listen to or what I can't. Uh, if I didn't like his speech, I would switch to CNN. I would like what's on CNN even less. Uh, but that's my right to watch CNN, MSNBC, Newsmax, uh, Fox. Uh, and I don't think any cable operator or any other um, private or public institution should be telling me what I should see and what I shouldn't see. CPAC was newsworthy. It was worth seeing. Um, I wanted to hear my former student, Ted Cruz. Um, I've been disagreeing with him for how many years? 25 years. I want to continue to be able to disagree with him um, when he speaks 
uh, on on uh, at the CPACs. I would agree with him on certain issues and disagree on others. That's what America is about. And so let us all have the right to switch the channel. That's the basic right, the right to switch the channel. Um, today, that is the bumper sticker, the personification of American freedom under the First Amendment, the right to switch the channel. Thanks for your call. Professor Dershowitz, could you comment on the pernicious impact, the principle of disparate impact has had in civil litigation as regards the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the impact that it has on business activity, on meritocracy, and the potentially its contribution to identity politics. Also, how do you think Robert Nozick would have felt about it? Mm -hmm. uh, what a great question. For those of you who don't know, Robert Nozick was one of the great philosophers of the mid-20th uh, uh, century. Uh, Bob and I were very close friends. And I had the honor of teaching with him for several years. We taught what was probably the most popular course um, in Harvard. Uh, it was called Thinking About Thinking. And it was uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who was at the time the greatest living uh, paleontologist and evolutionary theorist, Robert Nozick, one of the great philosophers of our age, and poor Alan Dershowitz, uh, who was a pretty decent law professor and lawyer. Um, and we used to start the class by saying, why would a class that's supposed to deal with intellectual diversity have three Jewish middle-aged guys from Brooklyn? Actually, Steve Gould was from Queens, but it's close enough. And, and the answer would always be, well, we have to hold that constant. So the only variation is one of us is a philosopher, one of us is a scientist, and one of us is a lawyer. And by holding constant everything else and just having the variables our profession, it focuses more on the differences between the professions. And uh, Bob Nozick was just, just great. Uh, you know, Bob wrote a classic book on libertarianism. And, uh, but toward the end of his life, he became more of an egalitarian um, and uh, people change and, 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 and grow. Uh, the Equal Protection Clause is complicated. Uh, it has protected classes and less protected classes. So that, for example, if the disparity is based on race, um, it's, it's very easy to challenge racial distinctions. You have to prove basically to defend racial distinctions a kind of overwhelming state interest. Whereas if the equal protection challenge is based on something other than a protected class, race, gender, religion, et cetera, uh, it, it, it's all you have to do is show a rational relationship. Um, so, and that's usually outcome determinative. If you get one standard, you win. If you get the other standard, you lose. Uh, it's a changing process, and I think equal protection is very important, and it is um, in increasingly important as we move toward identity politics, where everything seems to turn on racial identity, gender identity, and uh, other forms of identity. And the Constitution has to keep up, and it doesn't always keep up. And, you know, I could do a whole seminar with you on the equal protection clause. It was not... Uh, it was intended, obviously, to apply primarily to racial equality. It was done, uh, obviously, in the face of the terrible, terrible uh, plague of enslavement in the United States. And yet it's been expanded. Uh, the 2000 election uh, turned on the Equal Protection Clause. The Supreme Court of the United States wrongly, foolishly, and politically decided that the method of counting votes uh, in different parts of Florida violate the Equal Protection Clause. I don't think that was the right decision. I don't think that was the right application of equal protection, especially done by justices who had never previously seen the Equal Protection Clause in that way. But uh, highly technical subject, maybe the subject for a whole show sometime, but I love your questions. I mean, your questions are the kind that I would get from the best students, the best students at, at Harvard Law School, the other law schools that I taught at, over the years. So, um, you know, my show, The Durst Show, is a law school seminar, is a philosophy seminar, is a political seminar. I want to have more students. And please have your friends uh, subscribe and have your friends listen. And let's have more great questions and great comments on future, future Durst Shows. An important part of The Durst Show is your voice, your questions, your comments. Please call 24-7. The number is 216-710-0050. Keep your comments short and to the point. Again, the number for you to call, 
24-7 is 216-710-0050. Hard questions, criticisms, everything's fine. Just keep your questions short and I'll answer them all on The Dirt Show.